To preach for me is a blessing. Often preaching for me is like problem solving. It is taking the time to inquire with the spirit of the living God, the sacred text, my context, a peek into the context of others, our general society, other prophetic voices, and to wrestle with it all, sometimes in an attempt to solve a problem. Today, the problem, for example, is preaching peace in the midst of war. I believe preaching has the power to change minds and hearts, and then those changed minds and hearts can help change their part of the world. So let's tackle today the problem of preaching in this season of Advent, and that is preaching peace in a time of war. There's actually no better time to preach about peace than in the time of war, because I can imagine that everyone under the sound of my voice desires peace right now. And there's no greater focus for a, fo excuse me, for a message of peace for Christians than a message that centers on the commencement of the ministry of the Prince of Peace. Maybe that's what the lectionary commission and the Holy Spirit had in mind when they chose today's lectionary text, read for you today by John Schlerb. Thank you for reading scripture on today. Our New Testament text from the Gospel of Mark is just that. It is the story of the commencement of the ministry of Jesus. Here again, Mark 1, 1 and 2. It reads, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The writer of Mark points back to the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah at the very onset of the story of Jesus in his gospel. The prophet said that there'd be a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He then tells the story of John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord, and then introduces the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Apparently, the writer recognizes the pattern in what happened with John the Baptist and then Jesus coming in the wilderness. He recognizes it as the same pattern of events prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in the Isaiah scroll of his sacred text and, draw, and draws the readers, that's us, our attention to these patterns as the fulfillment of prophecy. And this same pattern, the pathway for the coming of the Prince of Peace, the Spirit revealed to me as a pattern of the pathway to peace. And the first component of the pattern is the setting. And the setting in both the prophecy and in the gospel is the wilderness. In Isaiah, there's a wilderness, and when Jesus came on the scene, there's a wilderness. The wilderness in Isaiah is the place where God's people were in exile. They were away from what they knew as home, and they were away from the promised land. They were wandering in the wilderness. They were hungry in the wilderness. They were with, without water in the wilderness. Some of them died in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place where there is lack, and there is hunger, and there is sorrow, and there is separation from the best that God has for us. That's how it is most times in the wilderness. In Mark, the setting is the same. It's the wilderness. John the Baptist is, is out and he's crying in the wilderness, the desolate. There's desolation in the wilderness. He's dressed in camel hair and eating locusts and wild honey, which actually may be pretty good for our health, but, but it's still the wilderness. There's loneliness in the wilderness until the people responded to his call. He cried out alone 
until they arrived in the wilderness. The wilderness is the setting for the pathway for peace. Because the people who need peace most are in the wilderness. They're in desolate and barren places where there is lack and hunger and sorrow and loneliness and separation from the best that God has for us. Now God can meet you in the wilderness. God can provide in the wilderness. God provided manna from heaven and sometimes a spring of water. And for John, those locusts and that wild honey in the wilderness. But it is still designated as, and for a reason, the wilderness. And I don't usually preach pointed sermons, but I will today. And my first point about the pathway to peace is for us to understand that there are those who live in the wilderness, and they are not obligated to maintain peace for the privilege. There are people around the world who are in the wilderness of life where there is desolation and barrenness and despair. There are simply people around the world and some in our backyards who suffer. And we have come, and we have to come, excuse me, to an understanding that people who suffer don't have to maintain peace for the privileged. Please hear me today, for any one of us can be in a place of privilege at any time. So I'm not talking about anyone in particular, for at some point we all have to recognize and own our privilege. Proverbs 4, 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get wisdom understanding. And we really need to get a deep understanding of this, that people in the wilderness, people who are suffering in any way, are not obligated to maintain peace in the midst of their suffering so that those who are not suffering can have peace. I kept getting this picture in my head, Dr. Georgia, of a person laying on a gurney in pain crying out, yelling because they're in pain. People want them to, to be peaceful because they're in a hospital setting, but they aren't obligated because they're in pain. And so that crying out is going to happen. And so we need to get a deep understanding. As a matter of fact, the author, author Zora Neale Hurston put it so eloquently when she said, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. And there is indescribable suffering and pain in the city, in the country, and in the world, even now in 2023. There are major crimes against humanity in various parts of the world that we know not of. Here Proverbs again, though it costs all you have, get an understanding that our privilege isolates us sometimes from the realities of a suffering world. And some of us who want peace need to first get an understanding of the suffering in the world. Consider the theme of the 2023 convening of the Parliament of the World's Religions. This year, held this past August at McCormick Place, the theme was this, a call to conscience, defending freedom and human rights. This isn't 1943 or 1963. This is 2023, and the theme is defending freedom and human rights. With sessions, listen to some of the session titles, defending women's rights in the contemporary world. Bullying of Sikhs, S-I-K-H, American children, bullying. Ethics and diplomacy of food. Gender-based violence, a human rights issue. Rape as a tool of war. Mary under occupation. The parliament offered hundreds of presentations describing 
the pain and oppression throughout the world. And if we're serious about seeking peace, we must have an understanding of the pain in the wilderness. And we must understand that those in pain don't owe us peace. The prophet, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, in his letter from the Birmingham jail 60 years ago, wrote these words, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Thank you for the segue, Dr. King, for both the Old Testament and the New Testament texts, which are patterns of the pathway of peace, continue in this way. Verse 3 in Isaiah, a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. And in the Mark text, verse 3, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the first point on this pathway to peace is to understand that there is a wilderness and people in the wilderness suffering don't owe us peace. The second point is that on the pathway to peace, there is a voice crying, crying out in the wilderness. You see, the pathway to peace sometimes, unfortunately, is not peaceful. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that there'd be a voice crying out in the wilderness. The writer of Mark echoed Isaiah and prophetically saw and heard John as that voice crying out in the wilderness. John wasn't being peaceful in the wilderness. He was crying out, make straight the way of the Lord. The pathway of peace includes some voices willing to cry out. And throughout the wilderness of this world, people are crying out, this isn't right. They're crying out, stop the harm. They're crying out for freedom. They're crying out for relief. They're crying out for equity and crying out for justice. The pathway to peace isn't always going to be peaceful. And when the Prince of Peace came on the scene, he came following the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord. Get this understanding that there will be noise on the pathway to peace. When is the last time you cried out for a cause? Can we cry out for the ending of Roe v. Wade and the harm that has and will be done to women who can't make decisions for their own bodies? Can we cry out for the end of affirmative action? Can we cry out because of mass incarceration? Or can we cry out for those spending lifetimes in jail wrongly and sometimes knowingly wrongly accused? Can we cry out for the harm done to the earth by the overuse of fossil fuels? Can we cry out because children are dying to gun violence even in their classrooms and adults can't seem to fix this problem? For those who want peace, the pattern to the pathway to peace in our sacred text isn't so peaceful, for it includes someone crying out in the wilderness. There's even more noise on this pathway to peace. The Isaiah text, take a look at it. In verse 3, it says, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Some of us were alive when some of the highways were built in our city. Was it quiet, y'all? Every valley shall be lifted up. Hear the noise. Every mountain and hill will be made low. Hear the noise. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. The metaphor of making a pathway to peace and in Mark a pathway for the Prince of Peace is full of noise. It's full of making things level and plain, evening out some things that were uneven, lifting valleys and lowering mountains, creating equity and equality. It includes making rough places smooth. Addressing the roughness of oppression and racism, the pathway to peace is active and full of sound. 
and things shifting and moving and leveling out for a new day. All noise isn't bad noise. It might just be noise on the pathway to peace. And that brings me to my third and final point on this pattern of the pathway to peace. For after recognizing the wilderness of the world and that people don't owe us peace when they're suffering, and after the crying out and the leveling of making the path straight in the wilderness, hear more from the Gospel of Mark. Verse 7 reads, John proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the straps of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit with me. Holy Spirit. Now let's hear what follows that in verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan and just as he was coming out of the water he saw the heavens part torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him my third and final point is the Holy Spirit is a necessary companion on the pathway to peace the Apostle Paul actually put it best in my opinion, in Ephesians 6, 12, when he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, he says. And he continues describing each part of the armor. Some of us know this text. And until he gets to the spirit. And, and then in verse 17, he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. Then he says, to that end, keep alert, i.e. stay woke. And always persevere in supplication. The conclusion of the matter is that peace is spiritual. And gaining peace where there is no peace is a spiritual battle and a spiritual journey. And unless we invoke and welcome and follow the spirit of the living God, there will be no peace. For the spirit leads and guides and the spirit convicts and corrects. The spirit inspires and empowers. The spirit heals hearts and minds. The spirit brings justice and the spirit brings reconciliation. The spirit led Dr. King to the knowledge of nonviolent action and, and nonviolent protest, which although often met with violence, ultimately brought about a change in this country and in the world and continues to be a strategy for peace today. Dr. King, a Baptist preacher, understood the words of Paul that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He also understood the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John 14, 26 calls the Spirit an advocate that will teach you all things. Acts 1, 8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the Apostle Paul says again in Romans 8, 20, Spirit, that the Spirit helps us in weakness. And just 10 days from my, excuse me, a few days from my 10-year ordination anniversary and five years, from, five years before our, uh, uh, of our pastoral anniversary, if there's anything I know for sure in this time in my ministry, it is the realness and the power of the Holy Spirit. For God's Spirit speaks. Anybody ever heard God's Spirit speak? God's Spirit moves and acts, the Spirit advocates for you when you don't even know it's happening. The Spirit convicts and corrects. The Spirit heals and restores. Yet, people, humans, us, we resist. We squelch. We ignore, sometimes with all our might. Many don't know and don't welcome the move of the Spirit. 
But in all thy getting, get an understanding that the pathway to peace must welcome the spirit of peace, the spirit of healing, the spirit of justice, the spirit of reconciliation, which is all summed up as the spirit of the living God. And now, even as I close for your need for personal peace, know that the pathway is the same. Gain an understanding of the wilderness you're in, that there may be hunger and barrenness and injustice in your life. And, and on your pathway to peace, know that you will need to clear your throat and use your voice. Cry out in the wilderness, right, right then, I promise you'll begin to feel your help coming. It's on the way. And, and on your personal pathway to peace, know that some rough places need to be made straight and some valleys need to be raised and some mountains. Lord, catch the vision and you may need to share that vision with the power structure that you're working within. On your personal pathway to peace, know that the Holy Spirit is there to help you. That the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will comfort you. The Holy Spirit will heal you. If you need peace in your life, I implore you to get acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Understand that you wrestle not against flesh and blood, the one in the manager's office or, or the one who, who's in that structure, that power structure that, is, that you feel is mistreating you. That's not who your fight is with. It's against principalities. It's spiritual. Allow the Holy Spirit to be your guide. And she will lead you on sometimes barren, sometimes lonely, sometimes loud pathway to peace. The spirit of peace will come and she will descend on you just like she descended on Jesus. For the Gospel of Mark says, a voice came from the heavens, you are my son, talking to Jesus, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. And as the Isaiah text says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. As my sister joins me in the pulpit, <laughs> the glory of the Lord being revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. Let it be so. Peace.